One, two, three. Okay, we're now recording. Uh, good afternoon. This is the March 10th meeting of the Joint Capital Planning Committee. And uh, my first order of business as chair is to make sure all members of the committee can hear and be heard. And I see everyone is actually here today. So I'm just going to go around the screen um, and call out names. Mandy? Present. Alex? Yes. Farah? Here. Anna? Present. Irv? Present. And Jennifer? Present. And I'm, I will, as chair, I'm going to turn it over to Sean, but I, um, I just, um, in case people don't know, um, Mandy, Kathy, and Anna are all members of the council. Alex and Farrar are here from the lib as library trustees, and Jennifer and Irv are here from the school committee. So that's the, the six person composition of the JCPC. So, Sean, we're so, ready to go. I'm a little concerned because I don't think we've had a single attendee this like entire process, which I think the, <laughs> I think the link works because a lot of people are coming in that way, but um, I don't know why we've had You told little... me not to bring my masses of Middle Street people That's true. that proposal, I'm... so I have not told them. The Board of Health is meeting at five o'clock about masking tonight. Okay, maybe that's where people are. People um, might be there. <laughs> okay. So uh, we have a few more departments tonight and that will wrap up our um, department review phase of JCPC. And then next week we will dig into the sort of the heart of the issue, which is developing a recommendation. Um, so tonight we have recreation, planning and conservation, and then school facilities. Um, and Ray Harp, our recreation director is here and he's gonna go over um, his projects. You wanna go ahead, Ray? Thanks, Sean. Um, I am, this is my first time through this process, so bear with me. Um, uh, the, I believe the three projects that are on the table for us in recreation are two pieces of golf equipment and signage. Uh, I suppose I could briefly uh, describe the signage first. I think that's one that has been one of the first things that was brought to my attention on my touring when I was being onboarded over here in recreation. It, it's a, uh, I think it's a need for our, for many of our external recreation uh, 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 areas, um, Mill River, North Amherst in particular, Mill River and the golf course, especially. Uh, there's, there's some uh, demand slash desire to get out and do some branding, to get out there and, and uh, inform people as to where our resources are. Um, I believe that that is that's something that I, that I, I be honest, I've gotten lost probably about three or four times and I know where I'm going. I can't imagine what, what other people are doing themselves. Uh, it's very difficult. It's a, it's a difficult turn. Both Cherry Hill and Mill River in particular are pretty difficult sort of nooks off of the North Amherst uh, 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 main way. We don't have any signage uh, at at Mill River, that is outside of the outside of the uh, recreation area, that really uh, draws any attention or claims a space. We don't have any signage. No, no. Uh, uh, there's there's no recreation branding there. Um, people who know it know where it is and know what it's supposed to be. But I think we can do a lot better with that. So that's the reason why that is. It's been encouraged for me to to make a, a point of that by town, by members of town hall, by our department, by users of our department. It's been a major issue for a lot of people as we go through. I can answer any specific questions about that as we go along. Um, should, I, should I answer questions about that now or should I look at the other ones? Should I introduce the golf equipment? Um, I guess you could do questions now because it's that, that one's so much different than the other two, which are very similar. Um, are there any questions on signage? Um, I'm not seeing any hands, but I have, uh, Anna, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, you said that, I believe, I'm, I'm refreshing here. You said this is gonna be consistent with the um, town design standards. Is that 
is that matching the signs that are going up on conservation areas, the new like white sign with, yeah. Yes, okay. yes. Uh, I think the, the more recent ones, if I'm to understand correctly, the more recent ones, the Kendrick Park signage is, is up to a, I mean, it looks like a different era of Amherst. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm assuming that, that the same things that, that make it consistent with some of the Groff signage with some of, I, I'm, I'm assuming that that's all, uh, that's all consistent with each other. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you were trying to do different ones for recreation versus conservation versus, okay, cool, thank you. It was more, that was more a curiosity. So I appreciate you answering it. Thank you. Um, my question was, um, we have we voted some money for wayfinding signs, um, particularly coming out of town. They weren't necessarily, I, I actually live just north of Cherry Hill and Mill River. And I sometimes miss the Mill River turn when I'm going south, because there isn't anything that says here you are. But um, would we also, because I've been stopped downtown coming out of the roundabout saying, how do I get to? And, right. Correct. and so the the signage to say you are at Mill River, turn here, or you are at Cherry Hill, um, would you be doing something further to the south to to say this this way to these or similarly to go downtown, you know, to go to Groff Park to go? You know, yeah. Um, yes. The answer, the answer there is yes. I know that like UMass has the Cherry Hill signs. UMass has some wayfinding Cherry Hill signs, Cherry Hill two miles down the road here. Um, uh, partially because there's that, I don't know the, the origins of why that came in. But it's got college kids play there. <laughs> I, I, was gonna, I was gonna say, I'm sure it has something to do with the fact that we that somehow we establish a relationship with the colleges to say, we wanna try and send them in the direction where we're going. I don't know. I don't know if uh, I don't know what to what extent like Puffer's Pond has has wayfinding signs. I don't know to what to what extent um, you know other sort of local landmarks that the college kids or first generation Amherst residents would be looking for. Um, yeah, I, I I do believe that some wayfinding maps would be important for us. I I lived here uh, for eleven years before I before I moved away as a student and beyond. And a bunch of the things that I'm familiar with now are just becoming familiar to me now because I went through a touring process and got outside of the college area, got outside of the downtown area. And so I was here as a, as a student and a young graduate and didn't know Groff, didn't know. And I drove by Groff a bunch. I didn't know Groff, didn't know what, uh, uh, you know, so I, I didn't know, I kind of knew where Mill River was, but I didn't really ever get over there. I think there's a large number of Amherst is sort of a transient community. I think uh, there's a large number of Amherst that could use the directionals. Uh, Chris, it, it. So I um, apologize to Ray for breaking in on his time, but we do have um, a wayfinding sign project that is working its way through. Um, and it includes signs for the downtown, either pointing to the downtown or when you're in the downtown, pointing out to various locations. And some of the locations that Ray was describing are um, in that um, sign system. We have these post signs with directionals and they point to things like Mill River and um, Cherry Hill and points north. So um, anyway, we'll keep Ray informed about that, but that is- Thank you. Um, that, that's system. That's, that's very helpful for me. Thank you. So any other sign questions? Mandy, uh, you, did your hand go up and then come down? Yeah. It did. It's more of a general question. So I'll wait till after vehicles. Okay. Okay. We're ready for the next. Hey, and then for the vehicles, the, uh, there are two requests in for uh, vehicles that are situated up at Cherry Hill. Uh, one is a is a rough mower in order. The the most important is the rough mower. They're both of of, uh, of functional importance, of of pretty high functional importance for for us at Cherry Hill. But the rough dresser, I mean the the rough mower, is the one that that we are most in need of because what we've been using was repurposed. Like a lot of the material there, it was repurposed. Uh, uh, it, basically the machine wasn't designed to to for the purpose that we're using it and it's already well beyond its its 
life expectancy. Um, this would allow us to use a, a, a rough mower that's designed for mowing the rough and put the other one that we've been using into a, a vastly reduced capacity uh, to, to, you know, we can still use it and take some of the wear off of the new uh, piece of equipment, but this is, it's the most, uh, it's the most used mower on the, on the golf course. Um, it is, it's the one that, that, you know, maintenance that our superintendent uh, has been asking for, for two or three years, because it's, I know that it's been, uh, uh, the life expectancy of the other one has been, has been uh, dwindling. We've been getting as much as we could get out of that. Uh, the golf course is beautiful. So I feel hard. It's, it, it almost feels like I'm, I'm arguing against the, the vision of what we have here. The golf course has been, uh, has been uh, kept beautiful over the course of this time, but I think it, it, it definitely is something that is, is uh, uh, against, I, I can't imagine that, it, that, that, that going through another year with, with sort, of, sort of the gorilla uh, uh, maintenance that they've been going through up there, I can't imagine that we can expect that without some major, uh, uh, some major upkeep on the, on the mower. That rough mower is, is definitely the, the equipment, piece of equipment that's in the roughest shape and is, has the least likely, uh, uh, it's, it's, least, it's, it's the least likely to make it through the full year without some major repairs on it. <laughs> the the, the uh, utility vehicle and top dresser is, similar we've been using basically uh, 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 what a utility vehicle does is it basically allows you quickly and efficiently to get materials to get seed to get to get uh heavy equipment around the golf course uh the, what they've been using there has also been repurposed and it's also uh has been on our list for a little while and necessarily it, we've we've been uh we've been asked to sort of sort of make do uh, uh, as we went through budget issues in the past, I don't know if that if if that will be possible uh, for the upcoming year here. Also, for the utility vehicle, top dresser is is uh, it, it basically puts uh, 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 it, it 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 treats the the the, the short grass. It it treats it treats the uh, uh, it, I don't know. It's it basically. Uh, uh, it, Disperses seed around around a, a wide amount of of land uh, in a you know sort of efficient short short time. Um, uh, those two are partners uh, are they're, it's partner equipment that I think uh, basically uh, again with the with the life expectancy of what we're using up there it becomes it becomes something that will have to be replaced uh, maybe this year perhaps perhaps through the next year I mean. Uh, it it is an it is an issue that we're going to have to deal with. Questions, Mandy. I just have a question that isn't really about whether these need replaced. It's more of when we purchased or signed the purchase and sale for Hickory Ridge. Did we also purchase their equipment, or was it just a land purchase, such that when that finally goes through, will we be receiving their golf course equipment too? Ray, if you don't know the answer to that, I, I don't. Dave, I don't know the. I do Dave not know Zomekel, the answer to that. Dave Z will be on. Um, he'll be on in a little bit for conservation, so um, we can follow up with him. He'll know for sure. That is that is actually a terrific question. I I don't know why that hasn't hasn't uh, come up in our conversations. I've talked to Dave about it a few times. That hasn't come up in our conversations, but that is worth looking at. Anna, so. Um, and again, and, and I don't know, Ray, if this is as much as a question for you or it is for Sean, as it is for Sean. Um, I mean, we've got like $100,000 worth of mowers on our, on our list between the three this year. And so the rough mower, I'm admittedly not a good golfer and I've gone like twice in my life. So the rough mower is not something that's like, none of these mowers can be shared, right? So Sean, we're looking at a forestry mower, a skag mower and a rough mower, and they can't 
do double, none of these can do double duty, nor can the two parks has another one and highway has another one. So none of these can overlap and, and support each other. I don't believe so. I mean, they're, they're, I think they're pretty specialized and um, Ray, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think they, they'll use that rough mower, you know, if not every day, every other day or, or very rough, frequently. The rough mower right? gets a lot of use. Okay. Um, yeah. 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 So yeah, part one was how often, part two was can they overlap? All right, thanks. It's more of a, it was a hopeful question. Yeah, no, it's a, and it's something we can um, check in with Guilford too, but I, my guess would be it'd be difficult. Makes sense, thanks. Irv. Irv. Thank you for the question. So I, I think that I am uh, channeling uh, Larry Kelly here, uh, who for years ranted and raved about uh, the, uh, the Cherry Hill Golf Course. Uh, and so there's been some mission creep here where before we, when this deal came down, uh, Cherry Hill was gonna be self-sufficient. Uh, the user fees, et cetera, would support it. Uh, but however, uh, over the years, what has happened in this particular presentation demonstrates it, it has now become an official Amherst Department under rec recreation. And I just want us to remember that uh, they're supposed to be self-sufficient and town funds were not um, geared to be expended upon this. But here we are and we're doing it. Kathy, can I, I respond to that quickly? Or Ray, do you wanna go ahead? I can try, I think you'd be a better expert at this. I, I mean, I, I would love to answer the question. Uh, uh, you know, and I know it was more sort of a, a general observation than it was a question for what we're doing. Um, I was, I think I've been preparing for the for for the uh, uh, for the Larry Kelly angle here for the last couple of months. I I I've heard plenty about about our relationship with the golf course. I've heard plenty about about our relationship with Larry when when he was uh, sort of sort of in the seat of of sort of challenging this sort of stuff. Um, I, you know, my my perspective from the seat where I sit is that. Is that it is an asset to the town. I don't know about the should or shouldn't. I've been asked very recently. I was asked very early in, in my time here. Is uh, should the town be in the business of running a golf course? And uh, when the town decides that that's not something that we should be doing, then my my intention has been before I let Sean answer the question with the hist historical background or anybody else can offer some historical background. Um, my intention with this and our commitment has been to make sure that when the town makes a makes a move with it, if they ever decide that this is something that we don't want to have on our plate anymore, that it is in the best possible situation to 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 be profitable for the town to move it. Uh, and so a large part of what my fall has been has been in examining what those the fee structure is there so we can raise revenue and and help the town out. Is trying to make sure that if if it is a situation that is tenable, we want to make sure that if somebody can come in and buy. I know the Hickory Ridge is sort of a is is a is another uh, 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 situation that kind of echoes in this situation, but that echoes where we are right now. But if we are going to make a decision on it in the future, I want to make sure that 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 the the golf club uh, the the golf course is is dressed up in a way that that allows the town to make it worth its while and so when i put in requests for it i knew that this question would come up uh the one thing the one thing that i told myself i didn't want to do with the capital request was to ignore it because it might not be something that we want to do in the future i think that uh, you know my intention with your help of course my intention is to is to keep it beautiful is to is to really examine the way we can raise some revenue and, uh, and make the town decide whether or not it's it's possible but i want to at least give it a chance to be possible that the town would say this is something that, that helps us out thanks Ray. there's a lot that uh, i don't there's a lot of it that i don't know about it there's a lot of the history i don't know about it there's 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 pieces of this that i'm stepping in and just saying well this is pretty cool i get a chance to run a golf club mm -hmm. i've never thought i'd be that in that position before I may have 
golfed a couple times more than Anna, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm running a golf course right now, and and that's exciting for me. <laughs> so, so I'll just add, um, Irv, your point's a good one, which I think this is a year where a discussion about the commitment to continuing golf at Cherry Hill is a conversation we need to have because it is such a large investment. Um, you know, once we buy these machines, it's sort of indicating that we want to stay in that realm for a while. Um, and there's some other capital projects coming up in the next couple of years as well for Cherry Hill. So I think that's a good conversation for JCPC to have. Um, one thing to consider is that Cherry Hill's had a couple of its best years, or, or at least in recent history, a couple of its best years, the last couple of years. Um, FY21 was really good. Uh, it either broke even on an, from an operational perspective, not including capital, but um, or was very close to breaking even. I don't know what the exact number was. Um, and this year, through the first two, uh, two quarters of the year, um, it's up compared to pre-COVID years. So, so it is doing better. And I think what we talked about last time this came up was, we don't know if it's going to be doing better permanently going forward because Hickory Ridge closed and now there's just um, Cherry Hill is the only game in town besides Amherst, uh, Amherst Golf Course, um, or if it's still COVID that's driving people there. Um, so, but I will say just from a financial perspective, the golf course has been doing better uh, in the last couple of years. And we're in position to pounce on that, seize that also. We've, we've put a lot of our, of our programming capital into uh, trying to make sure that we don't lose that momentum. Irv? Uh, just remember that uh, uh, in finance, it's not only what is happening right now in terms of your debits and um, pluses, but also what is what has been happening in the past uh, in relationship to income and revenue. And do those things uh, add up into a positive or a negative? Now, obviously, I would argue that it obviously does not add up to a positive. Mm -hmm. And I think if we went back over all the numbers, you would find that. But the question remains, and it has to, at some point, and I would think sooner than later, that the town has to decide whether it wants to be in the golf course business. That decision has to be made one way or another. Uh, the town cannot be permanently put in a position of saying, well, uh, we don't know, but yet we keep paying for it. If you if it's, if it's, if keep paying for something and you haven't made a decision, that means you have made a decision because you continue to pay for it. Anyway, I guess what I wanna say is uh, that the town needs to sooner rather than later make a decision on this and just bite the bullet and say, hey, we want to be in the golf business. We want to be in the golf course business. Or no, we do not. But don't, we can't keep sitting on a fence here. Jennifer. So Sean, you said that in the past year or two, the golf course has been doing better and it has been breaking even or close to breaking even, which says to me that like in past years, it wasn't breaking even. Right. Yep. Is that right? So that to me, that we're, if we're not breaking, at least breaking even, we're not in the golf business. We're in the business of subsidizing people's golf experience. So mm -hmm. that's very concerning to me. And I thank you. I thank you to her for bringing this up. I, I, are there other recreational activities that we subsidize <laughs> to that extent? Like when, like swimming, do we, do we take, I, I mean, I, I, I guess I don't know how all this works. Like, are there other recreational activities where we don't take in enough to cover the, the expenses of the of the recreation and therefore we subsidize that it, it just I've never played golf and so I it, it does it it that that just it that doesn't sit well with me yeah no I think it, it it's certainly on an activity by activity basis but there are certainly other activities in town where um, the fees that are raised do not cover the cost um, of of that activity so um, I think uh, there's some other considerations with that land. And I don't know if Dave is here and wants to weigh in on it. I, I believe there's some restrictions on what that property can be used for, um, which just, it, it adds to the conversation in terms of if we weren't gonna do golf there, what else can we do? Um, Dave, do you wanna add a couple, fill that in? Sure, I apologize for being late. Um, and I didn't, I, I only caught um, the last comments by Jennifer. Um, 
So happy to answer other questions about the property if I can, but, but to Sean's point, um, just to fill out, um, so, so the property was purchased many, many years ago. I think it predates probably everybody on the call working in, in local government and certainly me too, but it was purchased um, using state and federal grant funds. So it does come with restrictions. So the property is not unencumbered. It is, it is quite encumbered. Um, um, so, so that means that we do not have to continue uh, a golf operation on the, on the property, but we cannot uh, basically liquidate that asset uh, very easily. Uh, we would have to go through a very cumbersome state process to sell the land or develop the land or to use it for something else like housing or, or some, some other non-open space recreation activity. So I think that's what you were referring to, Sean. Yeah. Um, but and, it does and, not mean that we have to have a golf operation. I want to be clear about that. The grants said we we when we went for the grants uh, at the state and other and federal level, it was for um, recreation and open space. So golf falls under that category, and it's Dave. used for many other things, as Ray probably said for hiking and 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 sledding and bird watching and all those other things. Winterfest happens there and all of that. Dave, one other quick golf question um, that came up earlier. Uh, in purchasing Hickory Ridge, um, was there any transfer of golf equipment as part of that purchase or did all of that stay with the previous owner? No, that's a very good question. Uh, originally, yes, I remember years ago when, when Hickory Ridge, the first conversation started, we did we did approach them um, about the possibility of uh, them giving us some of the golf equipment. Unfortunately for us, they own I think a dozen other golf courses in New York, New York and New Jersey. So they immediately, you know, when they decided no, to no longer operate a golf course, they moved those all all to their other properties. So I did try, but it was for naught. Mandy. So my questions aren't, thank you for that answer, Dave, because I'm the one that asked that question, but oh. I don't have any other questions about the golf thing. So if, if Kathy and Irv are still on golf course, I'm happy to wait until that conversation's over to ask mine. Okay, I'll just, I'll just make a couple comments. Um, one, one, it was a, actually a question. A couple other golf courses have gone belly up, um, not just Hickory Ridge, the one in, over in Northampton did. So the, similar to Mandy's question about Hickory Ridge, um, but bigger, is there a used golf equipment market out there that we could tap into that weren't part of these big mega complexes, Dave? You know, and I, I just don't know whether we've explored where the mowers went and where the rough ones. So it's a question. I don't need an answer on it. Um, but my observation on the golf course is, A, the swimming pools don't make money either. So this is a question of, do we want to offer this as a recreation golf? And if you go out there, what's been interesting, and it may be a COVID phenomenon, is the age range and the sex range and the ethnicity range is a lot more diverse than it used to be. There are kids out there of all sizes and shapes, the high school and, you know, people who literally can't hit the golf ball are over there, you know, swinging away at it um, because it's good outdoor activity um, when it's golf season and they get they get to play when they're on the course when others aren't. So not the weekend players, um, a lot of young women, um, college age women, but uh, and it's pretty diverse. So aside from golf, Dave already mentioned what I was going to say. I'm, I live near there, so I get to see it. Um, I see it is that piece of land is used constantly. Um, skiers, hikers, the uh, cross country trail, and the fact that it's kept in good condition with those hills as a golf course makes it an amazing place in the winter time, you know, because you're not skiing through briars. So I think we have an asset. We may not be in the golf business. We may be in the recreation business and it happens to have these little clubs and balls. Um, so that, that was just the comment I was going to make. And the other thing I want to do is we do an Easter egg hunt called golf ball hunting. And I've been meaning to bring our car down to you <laughs> because we have maybe 500 golf balls we can donate that have been washed and cleaned 
where people knock them into the woods. So it's just become something we've done for 20 or 30 years, collect golf balls. So, I mean, people are donating equipment so that people can come and not have to buy their own golf clubs, buy their own balls. Um, so it, it is an asset for the town, whether we're in the business or we're just in the recreation business. That was my comment. Irv, I think, and then I see Irv, Jennifer, and Anna. Yeah. Well, and if, if, yeah. if the town has, if the town so wishes, it can do exactly what you just said, Kathy, is say this is a recreation asset and take the name of Cherry Hill Golf Course off of there. And the town then would be making a statement. Uh, as of now, the town has not made a statement to say this is a, the Cherry Hill Recreation Facility for the town of Amherst, rather than the Cherry Hill Golf Course. Uh, what's before us is not the Cherry Hill Recreation Center, but the Cherry Hill Golf Course. And that needs to be rectified, uh, I think, sooner than later. And I think, Kathy, what your points are well taken. Um, and so the town council, or whatever process we need to go go through, we need to say and, and, and say very clearly that this is an as, a recreation asset. The Cherry Hill recreation asset is a part of this town and drop the word golf from it. Uh, that would be deliberate. It would be intentional. And the, the, and the town council uh, would be the place to start with that. And it needs to make that statement sooner rather than later. Okay. So I'm not sure the order. I'm I'm going to call on. Um, let's see. I guess Farah is has not spoken to this yet. So maybe I'll call on you and then come back to everyone else who's spoken. Is that okay with people? Um, just to kind of piggyback on what Irv was saying, but if we were talking about the space as a recreation space, could we not offer it to the schools as a space to use, like budding golfers at the high school or in the winter for skiing? Because I know there's a fee if you go golfing there, right? um right now but could we offer it to the schools for winter for certain activities and then for summer for other stuff and go from there that seems like that would be an amazing and not charge the schools or the students is it's, that a possibility just throwing it out there in terms of recreation and how we could use it for our town in terms of in terms of school use, uh, uh, I can tell you that we've had as many as two different teams using the, the high school teams that use the course in the past. Frontier still uses it. Frontier Regional High School uses it as their basically a home site for, for school golf. Um, Amherst doesn't use it anymore, I think partially because of the, the, the uh, Sort of, sort of running into Frontier and running it, which there was a longer uh, relationship with Frontier's program. Uh, so the schools have used the Cherry Hill before. Um, I think they're over in Northampton now is where, is where the high school golf club uh, is. And I don't think it's as many people as they've had in the past. Um, there, we have been looking at ways to try and to try and keep the place active in the winter time. That's been another thing that I've been looking at for the last couple of months. Uh, uh, part of that deals with our, uh, the efficiency of keeping the clubhouse open on, uh, on winter months because it, it is, we shut it down and there's no heat inside the building. So anything that happens there is, is uh, uh, actual recreation, like, like the uh, cross country skiing, um, that they do a great job of grooming the trails and, and they have a lot of participation out there. The schools could be involved in that, I suppose, but I haven't looked at that. So Mandy, Jennifer, and Anna. I'm still not on golf, so anyone with golf should go before me. Okay, Jennifer, are you on golf? Yes, 
So these are some great, these are some great ideas. And I love the idea of, of broadening the usage of, of the golf course. So the way I look at it, we, the, the choices are not keep as we've been doing or no more golf and sell the property and get rid of it. Like my, my question is, how can we turn this into a profit center or at least into something that breaks even instead of something that breaks even on a regular basis, something that we intend to break even um, instead of something that actually takes from our resources. It's my opinion that no top tax dollars should be used to subsidize golf unless it's to like subsidize reduced cost or free lessons to people who have been underrepresented in golf. That, that, and that would be a great investment to create more golf golfers in town who then use the course. Like how often and to what extent do we raise whatever it's called, greens fees or fees for individuals to play golf. And can we turn this into something that benefits the town, not something that take, you know, takes resources from the town. And as for the swimming pools, I feel like, I feel like there's a difference because there's, there's a relatively high bar to participate in golf. You have to have the equipment maybe, or you, maybe you can rent equipment, but you have to have some knowledge already. You have to have just, I don't know, the golf mindset. Maybe I'm biased because I think of golf as something that sort of like skews towards more resource people. Whereas for a swimming pool, like you don't even need to know how to swim to, to go to a swimming pool. So those are just some ideas. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this and I would love to see some creative ways to um, beef up the revenue um, possibilities for the golf course. Anna. I, I don't know if Dave wants to respond to anything before I, I am on golf. Oh, okay. so. Um, I feel like I'm a little worried that we have like exited our lane pretty aggressively. Uh, and I want to pull us back to our lane, which is mowers. Um, and that's not to say that talking about Cherry Hill isn't important and relevant to our capital planning. But realistically, if we are saying like we have we have thrown some very uh, big ideas out there that our community would need to know about, uh, like these are not quick, simple things. And I'm really I'm, I'm getting feeling a little bit of like angst that we're, we're talking about them a little bit at length. Um, and so I think that, you know, if folks are really concerned about Cherry Hill generally, um, that's fine. That's great. I think there's validity to that. And maybe it makes sense to then suggest finance look at it, you know, like I th the finance committee look at it or have Dave come back and do a, a longer, Dave and Sean do a longer report or something like that. Um, but I just, I kind of want to refocus this a little bit because it's not that it's not relevant to the capital plan, but what's in front of us right now is a mower. Um, and that's, I, that's where my head is at. I just, yeah, thank you. And just to piggyback up what Anna said, um, finance will be looking at Cherry Hill as part of the budget process in May. There's a, um, they'll dig into the, the expenses and revenues for Cherry Hill. And, and Anna, next week, we're gonna talk about the report on um, the draft of the report. So we can put a couple sentences about this, you know, on a, focus on the mower first, but say there, the, a larger, a different larger question came up and we can write a sentence or two. I mean, we can figure out how we want to phrase it. Yeah. yeah. And I think that would be appropriate. Okay. Dave, are you on golf? Yes, Dave. thank you. And I'll be brief. I, I no, I really appreciate all of the comments that, that I've heard since I joined the meeting and, and Anna in particular, you bringing us all back and, and maybe pointing in a direction of, of of finance, looking at the broader pictures. Um, I do just want to mention for years, I've been involved in this very conversation. And actually, um, and when, when Ray started, you know, we had some pretty lengthy conversations about the future of Cherry Hill. So I think, you know, I know for one, having been with the town a, a while and, and worked on open space and Cherry Hill and recreation, you know, I think Ray and I would welcome, you know, looking a little deeper with Sean and, and with the town manager. And again, we've had conversations with, with Paul about kind of the future of, of golf at Cherry Hill. Is that something that we want to be in the business of doing? I will say I give great credit to, um, uh, to Barb Bills uh, for years, uh, doing the very best she could and, and really doing a tremendous job on the golf side of things at Cherry Hill and bringing in as much money as possible. But I agree with, with Jennifer in that, you know, we, we have tried very hard to, to, to make it be an, an income generating property. And I think people have done some amazing things there. I'm just not sure with golf as the anchor, whether we can do that. And I think that's one of the fundamental questions that Irv was raising and, and Jennifer, you've brought 
uh, forward as well. So I think we'd be happy to look at that and maybe in the broader context of, of the finance committee and the council in general. So one last point I will make, more housing in North Amherst, more residents in North Amherst, Cherry Hill we will be, is, and will continue to be an incredible asset for North Amherst. We know North Amherst is growing. It has grown over the past couple of years. There will be more and more people living there, working there. And 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 so that community is, is going to see more people. So I just would put a plug in. Cherry Hill will be an important part of that future, I think. So thanks. I, I just, Mandy, I will call on you and Irv, but we need to do a time check because we have a hard stop at seven o'clock tonight. So um, maybe we can make sure we come back if there's some tail ends of this to talk about next week for the report. Um, but just, um, you know, and <laughs> Ray said he came prepared to have this conversation. Well, you got it. <laughs> um, so I'm just thinking, can, maybe we can ramp up on the golf. And and Mandy, you said you weren't on golf. Um, and not, so I'll go to you now. Okay. Hopefully it's a quick question. Um, I noticed that both War Memorial and Mill River were on the out years for funds regarding playgrounds. I'm hoping that we're going to be applying for park grants and CPA money, uh, you know, for them. But my question is really around War Memorial um, and a playground there. Since we just got the Kendrick Park playground, which is fantastic and really being used, is there a conversation about doing something other than a playground that is recreation focused at War Memorial, particularly the possibility of some sort of mini skate park or something else that older kids, the middle high school crowd that can walk to that area um, might be interested in instead of a playground that kind of mirrors what's already at Kendrick Park now. Um, Ray, do you want to respond? I, I can say that we, we've been looking at a bunch of different options. I think more, more than anything with that, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I've had it as a separate conversation about doing a skate park, about doing something like that, uh, uh, where I took the job, skate park was one of the first things that people had said, well, if you get in there and do this, let's talk about a skate park. Um, that was separate from our, my conversation about war. I think a large part of the, the war uh, uh, redesign project is revolves around the fact that what they have there has to be redone. Um, you know, what they have there is probably unsafe, but it certainly is unsightly. It's not used. It's basically in disrepair. So we have to transform that space, uh, the playground space there. Um, it became a, a site as a, a potential site for a bunch of the different small projects that we thought about. Um, I would be very willing to look at that as being a, 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 a looking at a skate park as being a or something like that as being a part of the, the process in the future. And probably for the reasons that you mentioned, because it is basically older kids space and it is it is sort of central. It would be something that would bring new life to that to that area. Uh, just briefly, a rough moor is a rough moor. It is not so it is for the golf course. It is, it, you know, it's uh, uh, people understand or know what golf is and have played golf, they know what the rough is, All right? So it's specifically for the golf course. Take your so, length. Right. Yeah, go ahead. And, 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 try, and trying to separate it out from, well, you know, we're just talking about a more. Um, that is um, not really correct. We're talking about a more for the golf course. And therefore, you automatically bring in the golf course. I, I was going to come back to that. I, I do hear uh, what I heard Irv say earlier is that if you're putting money into the golf course, you're making a decision. Make a decision. And that's why the conversation about, about the town's relationship with golf comes in. Um, uh, and so if we if we throw the money behind golf equipment, behind behind this sort of the sort of major golf purchases, then you're making a decision to, to side with golf. I hear that. I understand that. To Anna's point about it being a different, uh, a different conversation, we're talking about a mower here. I can tell you that if we do decide not to be in that business, then, uh, and we don't do it abruptly right now, 
the course needs a new mower. I can answer that question and say the course needs a new mower if it's our course or something else. I, uh, you know, what is the, what's the need for the equipment? That golf course needs and needs the new equipment because what they're working on right now is not that it's basically repurposed. It's not, it's not a golf mower um, and it's not long for this world. Uh, and so we, we own the asset. I, I completely hear you, Irv. I, we, own the, we own the course, we own the asset. And if we want it to be in its best shape, then, then I think my request for the purchase is, is, in those, is in that direction. If the course needs a mower, and if we're going to turn it over to somebody else, then it needs to be at its best. So, so Ray, I want to thank you. Um, you probably got a bit more of a conversation than you knew you were going to get, but welcome to Amherst also. I think it's terrific that you've taken on recreation and you clearly have a passion for it. So thank you very much. Um, thank you. This, I survived this, so I think I can do another year. <laughs> So, so Sean, I, I think we could move. Yeah. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Thank you very everybody. Much. I appreciate it. Good night. So concert, uh, actually planning is going to go next um, with Chris. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, so I had actually two requests that have been melded into one. And the two requests I had were for, um, one was for uh, $20,000 to be used to help the planning department and the building commissioner um, to draft a solar bylaw. And there are things that we don't know about with regard to the solar bylaw. I'm sure you're all aware that solar, the solar bylaw and the solar site assessment have risen to, um, you know, a high priority in the town. And um, so, you know, we, we write bylaws all the time, but and we can pick up on other towns um, bylaws, but they're not all up to date. And there are things um, about solar that, you know, we don't completely understand. Um, among them are, you know, how do we deal with battery storage? Um, another thing that keeps coming up is the uh, idea of um, carbon sequestration and what the ratio is of carbon sequestration of forests versus, um, versus solar, you know, solar saving, carbon escaping and forests sequestering carbon. So we felt that we needed some help to sort of sort these things out. And we um, hope that we'll be able to hire uh, a consultant to help us with that. We are going to hire a consultant to help or a technical expert to help with um, the uh, preparing of the site assessment. Um, so we've already, you know, gone down that track. And Stephanie Ciccarello is working on an RFP to um, hire a technical ex a technical expert to help with that uh, portion of the work. But um, Rob Mora and I felt that we needed help too in developing the solar bylaw with the things that we don't understand yet or can't easily glean from looking at other cities and towns and what they've done with their solar bylaws or by researching ourselves. We, we felt that we needed some extra help there. So we put in a request for $20,000 for that. And then um, the other thing that we thought we should get some help with is whenever we talk about um, parking garage, um, the topic of the Boltwood garage, the existing Boltwood garage comes up. And um, Although, you know, the Boltwood garage was built many years ago, and at that time, um, it was built with the idea that another story could be added to it. But, um, you know, since then, while the building has weathered, um, there have been different things built around that building, um, and regulations have changed, building codes have changed, um, structural codes have changed. So um, we felt that we needed some help in evaluating whether the Boltwood garage would be a good site for additional parking. Um, would we actually be able to put another story on that as had been planned many years ago? And we can't say that now for sure. And Rob Morrow, you know, 
when he looks at the drawings, he can't say that. So we thought if we could hire a structural engineer to evaluate that garage um, and let us know, is it capable of holding another story? That would help to answer some questions for people if we decided to move forward with the garage somewhere in the downtown area. So those are our two requests. And then uh, the town manager and, and Sean, I think, and, and maybe Sonia as well, um, thought that you know the planning department often needs little bits of help here and there. And if we do need little bits of help, we need to come to JCPC and town council once a year to sort of predict we're going to need this help in the next 12 months or actually it's probably more than that because by the time we uh, ask for the money you know it's a couple months before you vote for it and a few months before july and we don't actually get the money until july so the idea was to try to set aside um, a portion of money that would uh, allow the planning department and the building commissioner because we work very closely with him to um, use the money for things that we needed. So um, Sean and Paul increased the amount that we had asked for from 20 plus 20, which equals 40. And they added another 10,000 to that and said, well, why don't we um, allot $50,000 for the planning department? And then they can use that to do the things that they've said it helped to figure out whether the Boltwood garage can ha ha handle another story and help them with the technical aspects of writing a um, solar bylaw that aren't um, immediately clear. So that's, uh, that's where this comes from. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions, Anna. Shocking, no one. I have questions about solar. Um, so, Chris, we, poor Paul was subjected to like 20 questions from me on Monday. We played a fun game. Um, and it, they were all about the composition of this working group that I understand the mission of which is to craft a bylaw. I do not doubt that a subject matter expert would help in that case, but this was not mentioned in that charge. And so I'm just curious about where you see this consultant fitting in with that process. Um, because I mean, folks, there are two resident members of that. I think it's it's important that people understand there will also be, a, there will also be professional expertise from the outside on this working group as well. And so I'm just curious how you see. And I also I'm, I looked at the request and I was like, you submitted this way back before this working group was a thing. So um, I'm curious how you see this person working with the working group, which, as I understand it, and I don't know, is Stephanie heading that up or are you heading that up? I thought it was Stephanie, Stephanie. is heading okay. that. Yep. That's what I thought. And so I just, I want to make sure, you know, I'm hearing you and Rob want this person to support you in the bylaw. I'm, I just want to know how all the pieces are coming together. So when it comes right down to it, um, the staff is most likely going to be drafting the text of the bylaw and bringing it to the working group for input, for comments and questions, et cetera. And so in that regard, you know, the working group isn't going to sit down and put the words on the paper together at the meeting, right? right. They need something to react to. And so that's what we are going to be doing. And we want some um, reassurance that we're doing the right thing, that we have um, enough access to information so that we can give the working group the latest um, you know, the latest ideas on, on whatever it is that we're working on, whether it's battery storage or whether it's erosion under um, solar plates or, you know, all those different right. things that, you know, we hear from the public, they, they're doing lots of research out there and they're coming to us with questions and comments and concerns. And we want to be able to answer those. And yeah. sure, we have expertise in the planning department and the building commissioner also has expertise, mm -hmm. but you know, there are a lot of other things that we're working on. So if we could get some technical expertise to help us to draft the bylaw that we're going to bring to the working group for their discussion, that would, that would be very good. Yeah, that sounds great. My second question is, this is for fiscal year 23. And I know that we're trying to get this group going as soon as possible. And so can you explain how the timing of this would play out? Sure. Um, yeah, by the time that the group actually gets together, you know, it's going to be a while because, um, you know, it hasn't been um, it hasn't been formed yet. The, 
you saw a draft of the charge um, and then it has to be populated and then they have to start meeting. And I think, you know, one of the first things they need to do is um, get an RFP together for the solar siting study. And so that's going to take some time. And so, um, and, and we're starting to collect a lot of information to draft the bylaw even now. We're not going to wait until July 1st to do this. But um, once July 1st comes, I think there's going to be a tremendous feeling like, oh my goodness, we only have until May of next year to get this big thing done. So, you know, we will have a lot of questions by July 1st to help to um, engage this technical expert with what we're doing. And, and so we're not going to wait. Um, the other portion of the working group that is working on the uh, site assessment is going to be chugging along and doing the RFP. My understanding is that they have their money already, although Dave may be able to um, chime in on that, but I understand they have a chunk of money. ECAC has a chunk of money that we're going to be um, using to hire the expert that's gonna help with the siting assessment. So we're not gonna wait on that, but um, I think it'll all work out, but you know, come July 1st, we're gonna feel a rush to get, get something in place by next May. Okay. Thank you so much. Other questions? Um, I'm not seeing it. I have one on uh, not on solar. Um, so I was going to switch to the Boltwood garage. Is that all right with everyone? So, um, Chris, you, you mentioned some things that have changed since we originally built it, saying we could put a second layer. One comment made by the head of DPW during a finance committee meeting when I asked a question, and this was... Sean might have been there, but I'm pretty sure it was my first year as a counselor. And I said, whatever happened to the ability? And he said, well, since we built the condo, the large white building behind Judy's, that set of apartments, he either said, since we built it, there's not enough room for the construction equipment to get in to be able to put a second story on. Or he said, and I, that's what I'm, I never went back to read the tape, or he said, there's not enough room to create an entrance and exit ramp because we lost some space. So would it be possible to uh, have a conversation with him? And, and then I, I asked, the next question I asked is, did when we were giving the permit, when the planning department was giving and board was making a decision, were people aware that by saying yes to that building, we might be saying, no to a second story on the garage. And he gave a little bit of a fudged answer on that one. Um, but so it was, so I would just want to double check before we do a structural engineer. The, the second question, you already mentioned this, is is it an issue of, of we, because we've built more in, in a way that it's going to, the entrance and exit will be difficult or getting a construction because, and so I'm not sure how you go about answering both questions. So it's, it's, I, I want an answer to this question, but just having, having heard that, I'm wondering if there's two parts, is the garage structurally able to do it with the new codes and with weathering and, or can we not do it because we don't have the space we had when we first built the garage? So that's my question on that. And I, I don't need an answer right now. I just thought that if the second was true, it doesn't matter if the garage can or can't hold the second layer. Um, yeah. Well, I think that the other thing that we're hoping that this technical expert can help us with is assessing um, the kinds of things that you're talking about right now. now. I understand that the Boltwood place was built after we built the garage, and there may be some aspect of that that would prevent a garage from being built. But my memory of that is that when it, that building was going through permitting, we did bring up the issue that we had planned potentially to put a second uh, story on the garage. And is that all going to be okay? And, you know, the general consensus was, yeah, that'll, that'll be okay. Um, but, you know, we need, I'm not, yeah able to answer that question. I don't think Rob Mara is really able to answer the question, but a structural engineer would have experience building these things, knowing what kinds of equipment need to come to the site to put something together. So that could be part of the mix. And the other thing we wanted to get from this person was some sense of what, if it's possible to put a second story on there, 
what would be the next steps? You know, what would we have to do after that? And does he have any idea of what a cost would be for putting a second story on? So there are, you know, sort of other questions that are involved in this um, investigation. So I wasn't questioning, I think this is a good idea, but I was just saying, you know, that, that it's that they're related um, and you answered it very well, thank you. Um, so I see, I think, Herb, did I see your hand go up or no? So Kathy, just keep an, an eye on the time. Do we wanna to move yeah. to uh, Dave and conservation? Yeah, I think so. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. Sean, again, or Kathy, I, I joined you late, so I, I'm just looking for a little direction. Do you want me to simply go through the list, or yeah, give a brief overview of each um, of each project, and then yeah. we'll open you, it up for questions. Do you typically put it on the screen or not? Um, or I, I have it on my desktop. I just I haven't been. So if you just want to okay. identify okay. which one you're talking about, sure. And and I guess I would start with an apology. I know that. Um, I had talked to Sean and I, and I see down at the bottom of, of one list that um, I, I had talked to Sean about uh, doing a little more work on the out years and my apologies because I have not done that. Um, and you'll see under conservation, um, you know, some, some big blank spaces, 24, 25, 26, 27. And I think, you know, I need to kind of put pen to paper there. I know we're focused on 23 and I do see that Chris added some additional quote ads uh, in some of the out years. So my apologies and I will do that. Um, I'd also like to kind of reserve the opportunity to talk to Sean a little bit about, um, you know, um, the possibility that some of these 23s may move to those out years. And that's typically kind of a fluid um, conversation, but let me give you a little, a little understanding, a better understanding of what these items are under conservation. So. Um, as you probably know, you know this department, uh, which which includes two full time field staff people. It's not a very large department, but they get a lot of things done. Um, conservation is is responsible for over two thousand acres of managing over two thousand acres of land and about eighty miles of trails. Um, and and historically, they have not had much equipment to do that. They have a couple of pickup trucks. Uh, they have uh, a tractor. And then they have one very small tractor that is very old. We and and I know and I always anticipate one question that comes up at finance committee meetings, at town council meetings, and JCPC meetings is, can can we borrow equipment? And the the quick answer to that before I talk about the individual items is we do the very best we can borrowing equipment. Um, we also rent equipment. DPW uh, does have you know they are the department that typically has the most um, equipment that is similar to what we need in the conservation department. And uh, in particular, Alan Snow and the tree and grounds crew is very, very open and, and supportive of, of uh, sharing equipment. And we even share uh, people power. We, we help them, they help us as we do with the Cherry Hill staff um, in the recreation department. But often what happens is when they need their equipment is the field season. The same time we need their equipment they're using it. So um, I'll go through uh, these items. And why don't I start with the chipper? There is a, a request for a $35,000 item under chipper. And again, Alan has been very gracious in using that, uh, letting us use that, borrow that. Um, but again, when they need it, we need it. It is the same field season that they have that we have. And what I want to, why I want to put a, a little uh, emphasis on the chipper is that what we're seeing out there is more and more of these flashy storms. So with global climate change, we will get one storm coming through and there will actually be 30 or 40 trees down on conservation land all, all throughout town. Just like we lose, you know, uh, we lose trees on streets. We lose trees that go down at Puffer's Pond over the parking lot that go down on trails that go down over trails all over town and some in South Amherst, some in Lawrence Swamp. And we have to get to these trees and some of them are 80 feet long or tall. And there's a tremendous amount of brush and other materials that need to be moved off trails, parking areas, et cetera. So that's what the chipper request is all about. 
Uh, and, you know, we, we price that out at about $35,000. Uh, that, you know, is probably a 10 to 15 year lifespan for us. We've never had a chipper. Um, so we often rent one, which can be extremely expensive. And I don't think is, uh, excuse me, cost effective to do. Um, the forestry mower is something that we use to keep our open fields uh, in early successional habitat. And more importantly, open. If any of you use our conservation oh. land, think about how do you keep Mount Pollux open? How, how do you keep uh, Wentworth Farm Conservation Area? How do you keep Amethyst Brook? How do you keep the open fields open? Well, you need mowers, you need forestry type mowers to keep those areas from brushing in. People really enjoy those areas. That's where they walk their dogs, they fly their kites, uh, they bird watch and they hike and they run. And um, to keep those areas open, we use mowers um, uh, throughout the summer season. The third item is uh, the Larch Hill, uh, excuse me, the um, Larch Hill building, formerly the Hitchcock Center. I, I don't call it the Hitchcock Center building anymore because of course they have their brand new living building down at Hampshire College. But we have a, a very old asset at Larch Hill, which is where the Hitchcock Center for the Environment was for all, I think about 50 years. And that building is very tired and needs to be, needs to come down. We've looked at repurposing the building. Um, I've had Rob Moore, our building commissioner, as well as um, Jeremy, Jeremiah LaPlante, our, our facilities uh, coordinator, look at that building. And it's a wonderful old barn that was converted to a, a nonprofit use back in the 1970s. And the Hitchcock Center was there, as I said, for 50 years, but they couldn't afford to put any money into it. And it's very tired. It has no insulation. Uh, the systems are extremely old. Uh, I've talked to nonprofits. Uh, I've talked to the common school. Um, it needs hundreds of thousands of dollars of work to actually have any other use happen in that building. And I think it's time for us to simply look at removing the building. In the spring, the, um, the, uh, the uh, basement, which is a walk-in basement, um, you know, um, uh, it's an unfinished basement that you have to go down through a crawl space, um, actually fills with water. So in the spring, there's, there's four to five feet of water in the basement. So we put on uh, a figure of $55,000 to remove that, regrade and repurpose that area. That number is a little dated. I'm a little worried with some of the increases that are happening out there in the um, in the industry. I'm a little concerned about whether that would get the job done, but we put that in as a placeholder. Um, we have a very large bridge off of Southeast Street that unfortunately, again, as we look at global climate change and we look at some of the surging um, and flashy storms that we, we are having now, uh, there is a very large bridge which is um, takes people from Southeast Street to the Norwatic Rail Trail over the Hop Brook, and the abutments on that uh, bridge have begun to cave in. We've gotten some cost estimates, um, and I have some grant money that I can potentially put toward this project, um, uh, and I put in a number of $50,000. I don't think that will do it, but I think that will be an anchor amount of money to, do, to, uh, to replace that bridge. It also happens to be a bridge that we need to get equipment over, um, our own conservation equipment, as well as a local farmer has an easement over that bridge to get to their fields on the other side. Again, this is a piece of property that we've probably owned for 40 to maybe 50 years. So the easement is something that came to the town years ago and uh, maintenance, for that access way that, that provides access both for the town, town residents, and for the, the farmer uh, came with the easement. So the maintenance is on us of that bridge. And then lastly, I put in a figure of $75,000. The town in various parts of our um, various holdings from our watershed lands to our water supply protection lands to our conservation lands, we own a number of dams and dikes and those dams and dikes need maintenance. Uh, think of Puffer's Pond, uh, an incredible recreational and, and conservation asset. There is both a dam and a dike at Puffer's Pond and both of those um, uh, parts of our asset 
um, need uh, work. They need constant maintenance and uh, they need repair. And it takes uh, very expensive engineers and permitting processes to get that work done. Uh, it so happens that Puffer's Pond is what they call a high hazard dam. The state rates dams in kind of the high, medium, and low categories. A high hazard dam is the most um, uh, the most hazardous, if you will, and and the one that we have to take the most care and concern with when it comes to uh, potential loss of life if the dam were to ever ever breach. And so, therefore, we need money to maintain both the dam and the dike at Puffers as well as dams and dikes um, in other locations. Think of Wentworth Farm, think of the Mount Holyoke Range. There's a, there's a, a dam um, at the um, Plumbrook Pond. There's a dam um, in Orchard Valley. These are all dams and dikes that we have to maintain. So those were the items that I, I have in the FY23 request line. I'm happy to pause there, take questions and um, go from there. Questions, comments? Um, I'm not seeing any, I, I have just a quick comment, Dave. Um, the, across the street from us, uh, someone had to take down their barn. Uh, it was a full demolition and they found a person and I can get the name who took it down for them because when he took a look, look at of the wood, he could use all the wood. Um, and he basically removed all the wood for free. They had to do the rest of it. And I just had Simple Gifts call the same place and they're taking now the Simple Gifts barn for the same. So if it would be at all of interest to you, I can just get you the name. I would, I would absolutely be interested <laughs> in that, Kathy, because that's exactly, we put in this, this placeholder number um, and and part of the part of our approach will be um, twofold. One is that we we would need to go through the historical commission because the Hitchcock Center is at least parts of it are would be would be deemed historic. Two, um, we would want to follow all any and all reasonable sustainability approaches to that building, i.e., exactly what you're talking about. Um, that is an old barn. Um, and if there are old beams and parts of the building that can be reused, repurposed, I would, I would love this to be a demonstration project for the town, but undoubtedly there will be costs for some of the materials yeah. there to be, um, to be uh, uh, taken away and there would be a cost to that. And then there would be a cost for basically um, uh, landscaping to make that a site that is safe for those people using Larch Hill and also for the common school um, that, that is, a, you know, right in proximity there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, all that this person did is he took it down and then he left some rocks and other stuff for the, for the, yeah. the homeowner to get rid of the rest. Yeah. So he didn't do the, he didn't do it, but, but I can get you the name because it, it was a good use of all the wood. Yeah. If you are at the Hitchcock center and want to take a look at that building, feel free to walk around. There are three, there are three, um, uh, ages, if you will, three, three different parts to that building. There's one that probably dates to the, you know, back to the 1800s. There's an addition to the West that is 1970s. And then there's an addition to the North that is 1990s um, and, and different woods. And, and there's probably some beautiful, old, there are some beautiful old beams in there. Many of, many of those um, materials could be repurposed. Okay, that was my only question. I'm not I'm not seeing anyone else, so I think uh, we can move to Doug Slaughter. And thank you, Dave. Just thank don't you. let Puffer, don't let Dire Hazard Dam go down because I know <laughs> the apartment buildings right below it want that dam to, to stay solid. <laughs> yeah. I think I think we all do. We yeah. want to be safe and and have Puffer's Bond for everybody to enjoy. Thank you. So, Sean, I'm correct. We're we're on to yeah. Doug and uh, Rupert are here to speak to the school projects. Um, Doug, are you going to start or Rupert? I'm, I'll be very brief. I'll just say that I'm I'm going to lean on Rupert to to go through most of the projects and kind of walk you through each of those. And and I'm just here to uh, support and answer any other additional questions you might have that he may not be able to answer. But I'll let him take it away and walk you through what we've requested. Thank you, Doug. Um, I'd I'd like to start out by um, just pointing out that. 
Uh, we're in a sort of an unusual situation here with uh, two buildings being considered uh, to go away or no longer be schools. And um, the time period between now and when the decision gets made and finalized and the construction happens leaves us in a little bit of a limbo land. Um, we, there are certain things that we have to do to keep buildings uh, safe and usable. There are certain things that we uh, really should do to maintain the value if the town were gonna take over one of those buildings for some other purpose. Um, but we're very mindful of the fact that, that um, those buildings probably have a limited future for the school system. Uh, so we want to uh, spend what funds we have wisely. Um, and it's a sort of a moving target as time goes by and we get more information. That, that said, yes? Rupert, would it be helpful if I put the your projects on the screen because you have quite a few of them? Well, I've got a second screen here. So if it looks okay. like I'm ignoring you, I'm looking at the other computer. Would it be helpful for anybody else if I put them on the screen or leave it down? Jennifer, I think I've seen your head. Okay, I'll put mm -hmm. them on the screen. That'd be good, thanks. So, um, Let's see what the screen looks like. Which page are you on? Uh, so we would start with the Crocker Farm Gym Floor. Awesome. Page nine. For, yep. Okay, excellent. So um, what what I'm what I'd like to do here is is uh, divide all of our projects up into three groups. Two of them are on the page that you're showing. Um, but I'm going to start with the ones that just say schools in the location column. Um, uh, so uh, and, and the reason for that is that these are uh, kind of regular ongoing requests that we ask every year or every other year. Um, so I wanna run through those quickly and then we'll have more time to spend on uh, some of the more unique projects. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, I'm gonna go in the order that's on my screen instead of what's on your screen and hopefully it's not too confusing. Um, we have um, a district abatement management for asbestos uh, for mitigation and consulting services. Um, that's a, an ongoing ask. Uh, we have projects that we can plan ahead, but there are also projects that come upon us uh, unwanted and in an emergency situation. So um, uh, particularly in Wildwood and Fort River, uh, but there are other. So Crocker Farm, uh, the asbestos is pretty much inside um, boiler enclosures and things like that, but there's still a possibility of uh, some issue that we have to deal with. Um, so that's 20,000 um, district energy management upgrades. Um, uh, I wanna sort of lump that together with district HVAC replacements and improvements. We have a situation where we have uh, ventilation equipment, fans, motors, controllers, transformers um, that are all uh, past their useful life. We are, um, trying to be frugal and simply replace parts as they fail. Um, uh, and uh, so those two lines are to allow us to do that. Um, um, district furniture is, is a common replacement, desks, chairs, uh, specialty furniture, um, cabinets, shelves, all kinds of things uh, that just need replacement over time. Um, and then the interior upgrades and the ADA improvements, um, sort of an omnibus uh, grouping of uh, interior improvements that we uh, need to do, like paint, uh, painting that we don't normally do on an annual basis. Uh, but also we have a long laundry list of ADA improvements uh, that we're trying to work our way through. And um, so that, that subject is to try to incorporate those two when they seem like a good match to sort of fold them together. Then, Robert, just quickly to add mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. for the committee. So this line item for the schools is comparable to the, the, the town hall line item that we have, which is interior exterior improvements, which again is for sort of general, um, you know, more significant than regular maintenance, but projects that you can't anticipate um, at this point in the year. Right, right, yes. Um, and district uh, school security, we have, uh, you know, security systems, uh, we have locks, we have uh, door swipe card systems. Um, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, it's, you know, we're always trying to make it a, a, a safer and more usable uh, space for all the students and staff and the public when they're in there. 
uh, and this supports us in doing those kinds of things. And these, these six, I think, items um, are kind of, uh, if you look, they're sort of repeating, they've been repeating, and uh, they allow us to uh, keep everything moving um, in a, in a in as efficient and inexpensive manner as we can. Um, then also on this page, uh, there are the special projects for Crocker Farm. Um, uh, we know we want to keep Croc Crocker Farm. We know that it's, uh, it's big blast renovation was something like 20 years ago uh, and its equipment is nearing, some of its equipment is nearing the end of its life. Um, so there are three particular uh, issues there. Uh, one is the, the, uh, the Crocker Farm gym. Uh, you probably all are aware that the uh, gym floor has had a history, a troubled history, let's say, uh, with buckling. Um, and um, there have been repeated efforts over the years to uh, try to control that. Uh, this past summer was uh, particularly bad, um, and it took months to get the, um, the wood to shrink again. Um, we think it's time to really redo the floor and address the underlying conditions that are causing all these problems. Um, and, and that's twofold. It's the, it's the gym floor itself, but it's also the, the ventilation system uh, isn't able to handle humidity levels uh, that we're seeing these days. Uh, so we really need to, um, to address that. And I would like to see us address that as soon as we can. Um, also, um, Crocker Farm uh, Playground. Um, the playground, uh, you know, our staff has been working really hard to replace timbers as they rot and keep uh, spots filled with wood chips. Um, but there are a number of, of safety issues and design issues that we would like to see uh, uh, get a big picture uh, and, and really address. Um, this is the first step to sort of do some design work on that, uh, to talk to um, uh, the various stakeholders there, the teachers, the students, uh, uh, CPAC, uh, all these various groups and try to come up with something that will be more useful and more accessible. Uh, so we're asking to, for some help to get started in that project this year with uh, some design and, and engineering work. And, and um, Rupert, I'll just mm -hmm. quickly add that the number here, the 75 and the 125, um, that's likely not going to be enough for the oh. whole playground. Um, yes. The, we're, we're still discussing whether um, once there's a design in place, whether CPA is approached um, for part of that playground or not. Right. Um, so this number could grow in the future, um, the next, in the out years, not for FY23, but in the year after. Right, I think, I think there's a line somewhere, uh, maybe in the description someplace that uh, talks about additional funding, of something like $700,000 uh, that would come from other sources, we hope. Um, but that's really up for discussion. We don't really know what it's going to take until we get a better idea of what we need to do. Um, but it, it at least gives, gives folks an idea. Um, uh, the, the other item for Crocker is a uh, unit replacement. Um, we've had a long history of trouble with the um, second floor classrooms. Uh, they become really difficult to use at the end of the school year, the beginning of the school year. Our uh, cooling system is unable to keep up with the, the problems there. Um, and um, so in this particular snapshot, what I'm looking at is replacing the, the unit ventilators for those classrooms if we can. Um, and I'd like to speak a little bit about sort of the, the thinking behind that because I think it's, it's significant. Um, everywhere folks are talking about moving away from fossil fuels in their buildings um, and um, that the we're looking at that in the new new elementary school building, for example, um, and that means using um, some kind of heat pump technology. Um, the uh, the heat pump technology today is not what it was twenty years ago. Uh, it's much more robust. It's able to provide heat at much lower outside temperatures. It's much more efficient than than it was. Um, and I think this is the direction that we want to be going in. Um, when I say heat pump technology, you can think about like mini splits, um, but I don't think simply adding mini splits to those classrooms is a wise use of resources. And here's why. 
Um, mini splits are very difficult to integrate into the existing heating cooling system. And you can end up uh, wasting a lot of energy if you have two systems trying to uh, do ventilation and air conditioning or heating in the same space. Um, so we really want to integrate this technology with our ventilation source, which is the UA ventilator. Uh, so this would be a good chance for us to take a, look, a close look at how that would work, how we could do it in a way that would, A, take some of the load off of the existing chiller so that it could do better for the rest of the building, uh, and uh, B, uh, give us some opportunities to do um, uh, to get away from oil for that section of the building in terms of heating. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure I'm right up to C or three. Um, uh, the idea that um, the, the problem with, with large building systems is that it's very difficult and time consuming to change between heating and cooling. And there are months every year when you want heating part of the day and cooling part of the day, or one part of the building wants heating, the other part of the building wants cooling. This kind of heat pump system is much more flexible. Uh, and this would be a start to making Crocker Farm a, a much more pleasant and usable space. Um, so those are the those are the quick highlights for that page. Do you want to go on to the next page briefly? Yeah, or... you just have a couple of vehicles. Why don't we sure. hit, hit those? So in the transportation section, there's, I think, three asks. Uh, I have to get my screen to scroll down. Come on. There we go. Um, so uh, there is a transportation transmitter and bus software. Um, we had an old analog transmitter uh, that let us communicate between the schools and the, uh, the buses and vans. Uh, and that has failed. It's old technology. It's not repairable. Um, and uh, the new technologies are all digital. Uh, so we're looking at uh, changing over to that and we're asking uh, Region, Pelham, and Amherst to all chip in on uh, updating our, our communication infrastructure. Um, and there's also software associated with that and with uh, our bus routing and all of that stuff that we need to upgrade because it's also getting old and obsolete. So that's, uh, this is just a share. Other, the other groups are also being, the other districts are also being asked to pitch on, in on that. Uh, there are two vehicles that we're looking to replace. Uh, one is a, a wheelchair accessible van, uh, and the other is a, a, just a normal special ed van. Um, these vehicles are over 10 years old. I think one of them that would, I don't want to be pinned down on exactly which vehicle we're going to replace, because if one of them dies, we want to be able to replace that one. Uh, but right now, my intention is to replace a 2009 uh, vehicle with 150,000 miles and a 2007 vehicle with about 200,000 miles on it. Um, and we're taking a very close look at, um, at electric vans. Um, um, the they're, 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 they're coming online. There's, there's a, for example, um, I think Ford Transit has come out with an electric uh, model to e-transit. We're taking a closer look at that. Um, my feeling is that uh, this would be a, a good thing to start on electrifying our fleet would be with the, uh, the pupil vans. Um, I don't have an item in for the infrastructure to charge them at this point in time. And I, uh, you know, costs in vehicles has been just unbelievably out of control. Um, so these guesses may be a little low. I don't, I don't have pricing yet, but um, I definitely like to look into that. For both vehicles. Um, and that's the quick overview. Ripper, can I add a couple, two sure. quick things? Um, one is the accessible van. If it's mm -hmm. still in good shape, um, mm -hmm. our senior center director has expressed an interest in potentially being the uh, purchaser of that when, when the new mm -hmm. one comes in and taking the old one. Um, in ARPA, we had set aside some money to increase transportation um, for the senior center. Um, and having an accessible van would help a lot. Um, so we've had some com conversations about sharing that. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other piece I'll just say, because I think it's interesting is um, Rupert, Doug and I uh, heard a presentation um, from a company that kind of helps finance the transition to electric school buses. Um, 
And so it's a, it's a complicated process and um, we're sort of just scratching the surface. Um, but I think in the next year or so, we'll have more information to bring back to you all about um, trying to electrify fleets and, and what Rupert brought up around um, charging stations. They also look at that component um, of building that infrastructure, financing that infrastructure. They've worked with one other school district in a major way in Massachusetts, um, I believe it's Beverly. And so it, on the, we've only had an initial presentation. It was really exciting, but I know that's um, a high priority for many is looking at the, the school buses and the school vehicles and um, converting them to electric as fast as we can. Thank you. Questions, comments? Mandy. Yeah, um, so I appreciate you talking about taking a close look at what needs done to Fort River and Wildwood because of the expected potential short-term use of at least one of those buildings going forward and the unknown use of the other building. Um, but uh, my question actually relates to Crocker on those issues, you know, because I had the question about, are you considering that for the other two? And you answered that one. But with Crocker, you've got the Univent replacement here and HVAC equipment replacement in FY25. Um, and I don't know how they relate to each other or whether one is sort of the same thing as the other, but in a bigger scale, or whether in two years you'd be doing univents now and in two years redoing those univents or something where they wouldn't be usable. So can you talk about how those relate to each other to make sure, you know, just to ease my mind that they are not competing against each other. Oh, thank you for that question. I'm sorry about the confusion, yes. Um, so the, the, the longer view picture of, of Crocker Farm is uh, we're, we're, we're approaching, uh, you know, we're coming up to 25 year old equipment, uh, which is kind of the expected lifetime uh, for say the chiller that's up on the roof uh, and a lot of the unit uh, ventilators elsewhere in the classroom. Um, and I think in the long term, we're looking to do the same thing building wide as I'm trying to do sooner with the, uh, the upstairs classrooms. So no, it's not the same unit events. It's uh, a larger project in, in more of the building. Um, that chiller, um, you know, chiller replacement is quite expensive. And um, I think that uh, it's really worth looking at converting the whole building to all electric and getting away from fossil fuel as much as possible. Um, you know, that said, we may need some for domestic hot water or backup systems or something like that. But um, I think, um, moving away from fossil fuels for the rest of the building is, is in the cards as well. It's just a little further down the road. Does that answer your question? Other, I'm looking, Mandy's hands back up and after you, Mandy, I'll, I have a couple, but that's no, fine. I, I, you can go next. I have a different question. So, but if no one was gonna raise their hand, I was gonna go to my next question, but go Kathy. Okay, um, we heard, um, either last week or the week before, Jeremiah is looking at um, replacing some systems at the old North Amherst School and uh, the fire station. And I'm wondering if there's any synergy, if you are doing some of this at Crocker and um, if we're doing it together with an engineering firm or someone to come in and advise it, I, I don't know whether you ever get, oh, if you're gonna get two of these. And he, he was doing industrial scale to uh, mini vents. So that's one question. And then the second is related to the hopeful new school that we're all working on. <laughs> um, if, if the new school has charging stations, um, could, could we think in terms of the charging stations could be serving middle and high school vans um, if we put them in the right place? Um, and, and of course, it, we don't know whether the quote new school is at the Fort River side or the Wildwood side, but just trying to think of are there opportunities that if we're doing an investment, we get more than the single use out of it or the single knowledge. So those, those are the two related. And then the last is, I know this is a stretch. We have 
a very good engineering high tech team behind the design team with the new school. Um, are any of their people useful, potentially useful to you when it comes to Crocker? You know, on on complex systems, on not trying to run two systems at the same time. And I just I have no idea whether people give away knowledge for free when they're not doing the work. But I'm just thinking that they're trying to assess these things with an ad reno as well of gutting systems. So those are my three because Crocker, when I add it up, it's it's well over four million dollars over the not this year, but if I go out several years. Um, and that's got the playground in it, but you're really moving toward, as you explained it, a um, major upgrade in, in its internal systems. That's it. All right. I don't know if I'll catch all of your questions, but let me try. Um, uh, in terms of EV chargers, um, part of the issue that we have in transportation is that we need to charge when we need to charge. Uh, and so the public charging stations might not be available when we need them. So I have a little bit of, of, of concern about that. And so far, all of the grants and subsidies for charging stations require them to be publicly available 24 seven. Um, so, you know, the grants that I've looked at for charging stations didn't seem like it would be useful for our fleet needs. Um, uh, the, the, um, I think I also am a little bit reluctant to spread the fleet out to different parking areas. I think uh, for safety and security reasons, as well as just plain logistics, uh, it really helps to keep them all in the same place. Um, uh, so I don't know that, that, that that's the way to go, but we're looking at a lot of infrastructure upgrades at the middle school anyway, uh, in terms of uh, electric buses and, uh, and their electric, um, this is region, but, but their electric system is, is, uh, is in the cards for capital uh, plans in the not too distant future as well. So, um, and there may be town grants, there may be a lot of other opportunities that we can fold in, but um, uh, definitely we, I, I think it's great to try to expand it. And I'm hopeful that uh, federal money will also be available to help, help with that. Um, in terms of uh, the team that's looking at the design of a new elementary school, yeah, I've been going on walks and tours and picking their brains and uh, asking them all kinds of questions. So yes, I'm, 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 I'm trying to take as, as good an advantage of them as I can without getting them too upset. Um, uh, and it's interesting, uh, some of the discussions that we've had, you know, just in terms of the ad reno versus the, um, uh, the new building with them uh, in the net zero group, as well as in the building uh, committee meetings. Um, uh, um, a lot of the um, heat pump systems that I'm talking about, uh, which are called VRF systems, it's a variable ref refrigerant flow system. The VRF systems um, uh, are much more common, uh, I guess, in, in uh, retrofits and, re and remodels. Um, and, and there's a, a stronger emphasis on uh, the ground source uh, water based water source heat pumps in brand new buildings where you can support it. So um, yes, they're looking at it. Um, it's it's a developing field. Uh, the main manufacturers of HVAC equipment are um, uh, expanding into sort of more institutional type equipment like um, unit ventilators. There are a couple of companies that are making unit ventilators that could sort of have a similar footprint to what we have in our schools. Um, that use heat pump technology. Um, uh, so yes, uh, and then lastly, in terms of um, coordinating with the town, yes, there's a big learning curve for all of us. Uh, and I think sharing that information is very useful. Um, I think uh, concept wise, whoever's first out the gate will, will um, you know, uh, bear the brunt of the learning curve, um, but I think it will be useful for, for town and school. Um, this kind of move in this direction. Thank you. Mandy. Thank you. Um, sorry, I was looking at something and trying to take notes at the same time. Um, 
My question goes to the um, unexpended list, or I, I'm trying to figure out what it's called, the status of approved projects list. I know I had this question last year. It always seems the schools have a lot of um, three-year or older capital improvement project money that does not get spent at a regular, you know, within that three years or more. Um, and I noticed at least particularly for this year that FY19 money, um, building and there's a lot of building improvement money out there that hasn't been spent in addition to a lot of building improvement money from FY18 and FY17. Um, and, you know, in looking at last year's unspent project money, there wasn't a lot of decrease in the FY17 and 18 numbers for the building improvements. Um, I just looked up what the new equipment for FY19 is, and it looks like that was funded for a replacement Fort River um, generator or HVAC system. So I might understand a little bit more as to why that might not have been spent because if it hasn't failed, <laughs> you might not want to rent the equipment. But um, I, I asked this question because it seems like every year we're faced with a hundred plus thousand dollars in requests for um, building maintenance funds for the schools, yet they don't, it, it doesn't seem like the schools spend, you know, a hundred thousand plus dollars every year on maintenance issues. And so they just seem to be building up year after year after year and in tight capital times, that doesn't seem like a wise use of resources from the global perspective. I am appreciative that you don't spend money you don't need to. And I, I want to make sure you, you know that. Um, but, you know, and so I'd like you to talk about um, whether the current year requests for interior upgrades of 160,000 um, and all of this is something that has been reduced because you have so much available in prior years or whether um, that money that has been available is that shows as available in our unspent projects is actually already encumbered, but didn't show that on this report. Or can you talk about that sort of to me dichotomy about requesting it every year, but seeming that year after year it doesn't ever get spent within two or three years? You need to unmute again, Rupert. Right, two screens and I lost the mouse. I'm back now. Um, yes, um, uh, I would say, I think we only have maybe half a dozen um, capital accounts that are 2019 and older. Um, I was just looking for um, uh, for my write-up of, of uh, those older accounts. Um, uh, I'm So I would say, I'm conscious that, that that we can't just sit on this money. We need to spend it or send it back. Um, uh, and out of those half dozen or so uh, older articles, um, uh, I think there's one or two that we're proposing to return, and there's a couple that we're uh, we're working on spending down. Um, as I'm sure you understand uh, these COVID years, it's been difficult to uh, keep keep projects moving. Um, there's just been a lot of uh, putting out fires and trying to uh, take care of emergencies. Um, but um, Doug, would you like to jump in, if I may? Doug. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Absolutely, Doug, go. Sure, yeah. so I think there's a, there's a couple of things that, that, that are at play and 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 Rupert mentioned uh, one of them and that's COVID and it's sort of uh, you know sort of stolen energy away from working on some capital projects just in general because we've been uh, and and some of them are related to some of the the residual um, capital projects we've we've been fortunate to have some uh, federal funding that's helped support those and so we've not spent capital because we've had the the federal resources that we've leveraged a little bit here and there um, we've also it's also shifted focus away from some projects because you know when you're making sure that your air changes per hour in all your classrooms is at a high level, you're not working on your energy management system and some of that sort of stuff. Um, so I think there's a couple of those things. I think also going back a little bit further is, you know, um, uh, 
our capacity to uh, uh, take on and work on capital projects was inhibited a bit. We had Ron Bahanowitz for several years that worked in, in our facilities department. Uh, we had his replacement, was only here for a short period of time, and then Rupert came on. And, and so I think there was a, uh, an overall backlog and, 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 uh, and uh, tangling, I would say, of, of some capital projects while Rupert kind of got up to speed and got uh, himself and his, and his staff in, in order and in place. Um, and so I think that that also has contributed over the last few years of, uh, and that's not to say he's not doing a great job or that we're, you know, not trying to get things done. It's just there, there, there are complications in, in taking in uh, a, a three-part system like we have because it's, it, you know, it's really the Amherst schools, the, the regional schools and the, and the Pelham school that he's uh, juggling simultaneously. And, and then, you know, you sort of throw a pandemic in the mix. And so, you know, it, not to make a lot of excuses there, I think we do take a cautious approach. We do try to uh, spin things down and are wise to try to spin them down. We also have had churn in, in staff that help us manage the, the specifics of the accounting part of it too. And so sometimes, uh, and, and there were a couple of the, the smaller dollar amounts uh, for you know, IT stuff that, that I was looking at and it's like, oh, well, we overspent an account that's newer than that. And it's a matter of making some transfers, but it's a matter of kind of getting to those things and getting those transitions made. And so uh, I think there's a number of factors. I don't want to be, you know, full of excuses here but i think that there are there are a few things that have played into that and and uh you know we're trying to be diligent about spinning things down and, and of course um i just sent to sean i meant to send it to him like yesterday because i just didn't on on some of these but there's one of the projects that we've kind of held on to at fort river that that we're going to yield back and it's you know like eighty five thousand dollars. so that'll that'll be a nice opportunity to reappropriate in a different way in capital um, there's a couple of smaller ones related to lighting at the at the two schools, the Wildwood and Fort. That you know, we're just, again, it gets back to what what Rupert said right at the beginning of his remarks about trying to strike the right balance on sort of safety, security, and and uh, building health, and not spending money that then we're going to immediately sort of rip out and get rid of. You know, so it's it's trying to strike the right balance on some of those, and and so th some things kind of persist a bit longer than any of us would like in that regard. Um, so you know, definitely want to. Let, you know we're respectful of that and, and i've sat in the chairs that you guys are sitting in and, and sort of gone through the same set of questions for other people that have been in, in my now current position and 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 in you know uh, others uh around that topic you don't want to sit on the cash if it's not getting used it's not doing anybody any good so we definitely want to try to try to approach those projects and and, and get them moving if we can and but we also want to be wise about it not waste the waste the resource either thank you so much for those responses Um, I'm, I'm seeing, okay, Rupert's hand is up. Rupert, um, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, I just wanted to say, um, I think some of the consequences of, of unspent capital funds, um, are showing up, uh, invisible, are not showing up. Uh, that is to say, uh, we might have been asking for more money, say, for electrical upgrades, but we still have some money left over from prior articles for electrical upgrades. So there are a number of areas where we we, we might have been asking for money, but because we haven't used what we had, uh, we didn't feel it was appropriate. Uh, but it's hard to define those because they're just blank on the page. Thank you. And, you know, I think, Sean, you had said earlier that you and Sonia would be looking at the extent that there's some repurposing as we look at the, the total picture. And I don't know whether that'll be next week. Um, yeah. Yeah. In, in yeah, we can bring we can bring back an updated um, with the list that Doug sent me. We can bring back an updated list of the um, unexpended articles and you'll see some new ones that can be returned to the town. Um, and in past years, at, at times, we've repurposed that money. Um, I think last year we did it for, I can't remember what project it was, but we did it last year for something. Um, so yeah, we'll bring back that updated list. So I don't see any public, so then therefore we won't have any public comments. Um, but I just want to um, look around the screen because I, I think you said to us, this is the end of us going through all the projects. Is that correct? So yep. yeah, I think we've gone through all the departments. So next week, um, we'll start to focus on the report that we would be writing, and we can send you again the one that we did last year, just as uh, what, what, what the report from JCPC looked like. 
And for the most part, most of our discussion focused around, are there any areas that we have major questions about something, you know, that we want to either know more or, or have doubts about, but also things that have come up. And I would use the golf course tonight as one of them that we want to write some additional sentences. And my memory from an earlier one, and Irv was talking about the uncertainty with buying vehicles that you you put forth a certain price and then it turns out it costs you a lot more. And do we want to have um, a fund the way we have a sustainability fund? Do we have, want to have a fund that then you don't have to come back to the council to ask for a new appropriation because it turned out to be 10,000 more. So that was an idea that came up. So I, I think everyone should come with anything that's beyond the, the easy part is saying we like your list. Um, and thank you for the original draft report. And I will assemble or Sean will assemble some of the tables that can go into it. We don't have to redo the tables he's already given us. Um, and it's more a question of what we're writing at the beginning of the report on any comments or recommendations beyond we recommend the list that was re recommended to us. Um, so I don't know whether, I mean, Alex has been through this more times than any of the rest of us, any words of advice, but if we're, we're turning toward what is in the report, I don't wanna, I will do a draft, but I don't wanna do a draft for next week. I would just do an outline of some things I heard and any thoughts that anyone has, if you wanna send them to me, I will, collect them in a, not even an outlining way, just bullets, um, you know, so we can talk about them. So I, I think that's it. You know, the minutes have been amazing, everyone. Um, so the minutes are pretty good record. You don't have to go back and look at the videos. And we have the original documents that Sean gave us that are both looking out five years, looking at the inventory. And we had a discussion about the inventory too. So we will comment on all the pieces. Um, so um, coming back uh, with ideas uh, is great. And we're making, you all remember, we're making a recommendation to the town manager. I mean, we the report goes to the town council, but this basically feeds into the town manager's report that then comes back to us. Sean? Yeah, I was going to just add, if there are any outstanding questions on any of the projects that you um, that we need answers to, just email them to Kathy and I. Um, I know we have one on um, that we need to come back to like uh, was the Jones Library, uh, the Shelvane, and if it was part of the CPA project. Um, so we'll have, we have more information, we can come back and discuss that one. Um, but if there's other projects that there were unanswered questions um, that we didn't get to and you remember them, uh, just send them to Kathy and I. And it's one I noticed the other day and Sean already got me an answer, but I think it would be good to bring to us that I noticed in the Hampshire Gazette that Northampton bought a ladder truck and they paid a million dollars for it. And our, our request was a million point five. So I asked why, you know, what's the difference? And they are different vehicles. So we, you might want to bring that back. Just yeah, that well, that's a good one. Because yeah. it was a $500,000 difference for something that looked like at least a similar thing. Um, so it was enough that it caught my eye. Um, so that that was when I asked, but it's kind of been asked and answered, but I think it's still something that worth discussing. Yeah, and I think the town manager specifically is looking for guidance from the JCPC on that one, because it is sort of a, um, it's a trade-off conversation is the additional, uh, we'll come back to it next week, but the letter truck we're proposing has some additional features, but they're very expensive. And so the question is, you know, from looking from at, at it from a JCPC point of view is do you, um, recommend that or not. And Sean, perhaps you can get us something that's a few sentences, even if it's just the thing. So everyone has the same shared yeah. knowledge the, the when we're talking about it. Yep. I think that's it. Um, I'm really glad to see the Crocker list. Um, I, you know, I think it's good that we're saying, let's, well, let's not just focus on the two schools that are the super big ticket items, but, but keep up with Crocker and make sure we're doing the investment we need for Crocker. Um, Jennifer has her hand up. I'm oh, sorry, I have two questions. First, what time are we meeting next week? 6.30 is the um, time for next week. Okay, can you or someone resend the meeting invitation? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then secondly, so we've heard from all the departments now and we have three or four more meetings. So just generally speaking, so that I can report back to the school committee, what will we be doing for the next few meetings? We 
next week, since we actually have more breathing room than normal, Jennifer, and we don't have to meet all three times. Okay, so we would talk about what we want in the report that would be beyond just the boilerplate. So looking at the earlier report, and then um, I will do a draft that I would do my best to turn around really quickly so we could be reading something and uh, doing a group edit on it. Um, and Alex in the past has always made sure that my poorly written sentences turn into excellent sentences or where I'm not clear. I sometimes am too terse. She adds the extra words, but anyway, she's always offered to be a second writer just to clean it up. But that would be, you know, get the ideas that would go in the report, look at a draft report. And if we're pretty close, we can just go to go over the finish line at that point. But it's it's the it's getting the report out is what we'll be doing. Thank you. And thank you, Sonia, for for being with us the whole time. <laughs> so I think we are adjourned um, at 6.55. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a, a very active meeting with a lot of good comments and thank you schools people for a good clear presentation. Thank you very much.